Before the revolution, there were lots of horrible variants of the death sentence in France, including hanging, burning, drawing and quartering, breaking on the wheel, tearing people apart with horses. And if you were of rank and had the gracious mercy of the king, you could get beheaded by the sword. On the 10th of October, 1789, Dr. Joseph Ignace Guillotin proposed to the assembly that all persons condemned to death should be dispatched the same way, and the most efficient method would probably be beheading. He didn't get a good answer at the time, but he tried again on the, 10th, on the 1st of December, adding this time that he thought they ought to have a machine to do the job. He assured the assembly that, Je vous fais sauter la tête d'un clin d'œil, et vous ne souffrez point, which was greeted apparently with gales of laughter. The question was finally settled during the debate on capital punishment in May 1791, when it was agreed that tout condamné à mort aura la tête tranchée, using the sword. But this was actually far from solving the problem. In 1792, a letter from the administration of the city of Paris stated that because of their inexperience with the sword, the executioners are making a terrible mess of this. A letter from Sanson in the name of all the executioners confirmed the problem and asked the assembly to provide as soon as possible a machine to make the executions quick and clean. And in the meantime, the Minister of Justice wrote to the President of the Assembly suspending all executions. The, se the assembly charged the Secretary of the College of Surgeons, Dr. Antoine Louis, with finding a mechanical means of, ex of ex execution. Dr. Louis replied back that he thought there would be no great problem in this and he would get a machine made as soon as possible, which would ensure that the condemned, condemned person was held rigid while his neck was cut. The assembly duly passed a, degree, a decree saying, okay, this was fine, this is how we'll do it. All that now was needed was the machine. And that turned out to be far from being as simple as Dr. Louis had expected. In point of fact, decapitation machines were not a new concept. There's a history of their being in use in various parts of Europe since the 13th century. The first one I know of is the uh, guillotine known as the Halifax gibbet, which was first built in 1286 and was still in use in 1650 and Hollingshead Chronicles show it being used in Ireland for an execution in 1307, and there is record of it being used in Edinburgh in 1578 for the decapitation of James Douglas of Morton. In fact, there were prints all over Europe of machines being used. One in the Collection de Gravure de Jean de Bavière in the Bibliothèque Nationale dates from 1400. There's another one in a drawing by Cranach dating 1550, and this one is in a book printed in Bologna in 1555. There's also a reference of a machine of some sort being used for the beheading of Henri de Montmorency in Toulouse on the 30th of October, 1632. But back to Paris. By April 1792, the judges were really getting cross. Moreau, the judge of the third criminal court, wrote on the 11th of April that he had a prisoner whom he had condemned to death without having any idea of when, how, or even if this was going to happen. The ministry replied they were about to start on a new machine built by a German piano maker called Tobias Schmidt. And the final trials took place on the 15th of April in the presence of the maker, Dr. Louis, Dr. Guillotin, and the state executioner, Charles-Henri Sanson. The trials were a great success, and the assembly promptly passed the loi relative à la peine de mort, making decapitation using the new machine the only permitted method of capital punishment. At this time, the machine was referred to as la louison, although Dr. Louis never really got to enjoy his newfound fame since he died a month later. So why is it la guillotine and not la louison? Well, perhaps it's because Mirabeau had been making fun of Guillotin saying that if and when a machine ever did get made, it should be named after the good doctor. Maybe it's because 
Il a été guillotiné, rolls off the tongue, rather better than il a été louisonné. By the way, Guillotin went to court to establish his right for a patent on the new machine, but lost. On the 25th of April, 1792, a huge crowd turned up at the Place de Grève to see a thief, Nicolas Jacques Pelletier, executed by the new machine. The machine worked fine, but the crowd was very upset. They threw things at the executioners, started a riot, and complained bitterly that they'd been cheated out of their usual fun as the thing was over far too quickly. There were also some problems still with the machine. The main problem was that the condemned person had to be held down on the banquette by the executioner and his assistants. The other was that the blade, the, called the mouton, although it had been improved by making it triangular instead of curved, it had no header to stabilize it and it was sliding up and down simply in grooves in the wooden uprights. In fact, it was liable to get stuck on the way up, or even worse, get stuck on the way down. Anyway, Schmidt settled the problem by redesigning the machine. He added a pivoting board called La Bascule, to which when upright the condemned person could be strapped. The board then pivoted into a horizontal position, the guy was pushed forward, the head went into the lunette and down came the blade. He quoted a sum of 329 leaves, seven soles and four deniers per machine, including a basket at the front for the heads and a basket at the side for the bodies. He made two machines, one each for Paris and Versailles. And in June 1792, with an order for 83 machines, one for each département, ready, the government sent an engineer called Giraud to check out Schmidt's latest offering. Giraud's boss, Carlier, issued a report to the ministry saying that, although better than the original engine, some further improvements were still needed, which Schmidt agreed to do, largely a question of increasing the weight of the blade and making it run in wheeled carriage in lubricated metal grooves. By the way, the machine was extremely easy to transport now. Schmidt had invented the IKEA Office Depot flatback and the infernal machine could be taken apart and it fitted perfectly within the interior of a standard long distance carrier's cart. Poor old Schmidt. Despite all his work and what seemed to be a reasonable price, Giro wrote to the minister recommending that the order be given to a mate of his called René Noël Clairin at a price of 500 leaves. Just goes to show that even in revolutionary France, there were dodgy deals. Schmidt didn't actually lose out that much. After Thermidor, he became a major building contractor and made several fortunes. There's often some confusion about where the guillotine was at any one time in Paris, especially during the terror, where it was moving all over the place. Some of this may be due to the changes of names of the places where it was, as you can see on this slide. After the first criminal execution at the Place de Grève in 1792, the first political execution was on August 22nd, 1792, and the guillotine was moved to the Place du Carousel so that Colonel d'Engrement to be executed in front of the Tuileries. So we now have two sites, one for criminal executions, the Place du Grève, and one for political executions at the Place du Carousel. So between August 92 and January 93, machine moved between the two. In January 19, 1793, it was decreed that the execution of Louis the next day should take place at the Place de la Révolution largely for reasons of security. After the execution, the guillotine went back to its pendulum existence between the Place de Grève and what was now called the Place de la Réunion until May 1793. In May 1793, the convention changed its meeting rooms from the Salle du Manège in the Tuileries to the larger Salle des Machines and discovered to their horror that they now had the infernal machine right outside their front door. 
So they told the administration of Paris to move it. Well, the obvious place to move it to was the Place de la Révolution, where it was moved on the 11th of May, 1793, and erected near the gate leading to the Tuileries. The previous guardroom with the Swiss guards on this entrance now became the famous restaurant Le Cabaret de la Guillotine, which had a menu inspired by the principal figure being beheaded that day, and a list of beheading per and persons being beheaded was printed on the back of the menu. By June the 7th, when it was removed to allow the passage of the uh, Fed de l'Etat Suprême, there had been a total of 1,306 executions of the Place de la Révolution. One of the great hopes of the Fed de l'Etat Suprême was that it would like be a new beginning and the guillotine would now only be used for criminal executions. Well, the passing of the Loi du Vin de Perrier knocked that one on the head. And on the 23rd of Perrier, the guillotine was re-erected at the Barrier du Trône at the end of the Faubourg Saint-Antoine near the remains of the Bastille where in the two days it was there, it clocked up a record 97 executions. The lo locals, however, complained bitterly about it being there, and it was moved again on the 25th of Perrier to the extreme eastern limit of Paris at the Place du Trône Renversé, now the Place de la Nation. During the time it stayed there, the machine kept up the high rate of executions with a total of 1,284 decapitations in 43 days. It was moved back again to the Place de la Révolution on the 10th of Thermidor for the execution of Robespierre, Saint-Just and the, the Thermidorians that evening. On the 13th of Thermidor, after, <coughs> after Sanson had gone for another record by executing 103 people in three days, it went back to the Place de la Nation until November 1794. Then it went back to the Place de la Grève, Place de Grève for both criminal and political executions until June 1795 when the military tribunal brought it back to the Place de la Révolution for the executions of those involved in the uprising of Prairial. After these executions it was disassembled and put into storage and only brought out and erected in the Place de Grève as needed. So where did they bury all the victims? Well, the problem about burial grounds started when the church was disestablished in 1789, which meant the ownership of all cemeteries was passed over to the local municipality. Paris promptly sold most of them off, leaving only the two southern cemeteries of Beaugirard and L'Entre du Clamart. However, with the advent of the political executions, the authorities realized they'd probably need a lot more space and decided in December 1792 to build a new ceremony, cemetery called Ville Levesque on the site of the herb garden of the nuns of La Madeleine, which is the site of the present Chapelle Expiatoire in the Rue Pasquier. The new burial ground's first victim was Louis himself. And Ville Levesque continued to receive victims throughout 1793 including figures like Charlotte Corday, Marie-Antoinette, Olympe de Gouges, Manon Roland, Philippe Egalité, and lots more, of course. By March 1794, however, the cemetery was over full, and the local residents were, very, were presenting petitions complaining of bloodstains on the roads <coughs> and the smell from the open graves. The next area chosen was much more convenient for the Place de la Révolution was originally a private park of the Orléans family in the Faubourg de la Petite Pologne, in the Rue des Erancis, which is now the area of the Parc Monceau. It received its first victims in March 1794. After the Madeleine was closed on the 5th of Germinal, it was 25th of March 1794, the new cemetery took on all the victims of the guillotine. However, following the Removal of the engine of death to the Place de la Nation, another new burial ground was needed. The first choice was a small cemetery called Sainte Marguerite, which was used between the 19th and 21st of June, but as it was in the middle of a residential area, this was not a popular choice. And a larger and less controversial site was found in the garden of the convent of the Car Canonesses of Saint Augustine at Picpus. Mousseau et Rancis was reopened 
to receive the 103 corpses of the three days of Thermidor. When the guillotine was moved back to the Place de la Nation, Erancis was closed and the burial pits covered over. After Brumaire, the area was redeveloped as housing. Further development of the Grand Boulevard and particularly the Avenue Hoche by Haussmann, together with the development of the Parc Monceau by his assistant Alphon, means that no one really knows the exact spot where the remains of the greatest figure of the revolution might be. It's usually assumed that the Parc Monceau was Robespierre's final resting place, but there is another possibility. Barra claims that during the events of Thermidor, Sanson the executioner asked him how the remains, and particularly the heads of those executed on 10th Thermidor, should be disposed of. Barra claims that he gave the order to put them in the same burial ground as the remains of the royal family. Quote, <coughs> Qu'on les jette dans la fosse des capés. Ce sera encore de la royauté pour Robespierre, puisque lui, il paraît qu'il en a le goût. And in his written memoirs, <coughs> Barra again asserts that les cadavres des suppliciés du 10 Thermador vont combler et fermer la cité naffreuse de la cimetière de la Madeleine. Could the bones of Robespierre really have been mingled in with those of Louis, Marie Antoinette, Charlotte Corday, and a lot of the Swiss guys? It's, it's a thought. Thank you.